reading this morning is from Luke's Gospel, Luke chapter 1, verses 39 to 26. Steve is going to be reading for us. Uh, it reads the passage, which we now call the Magnificat. Then we read Psalm. And as Steve reads, I just want you to focus. <clears throat> You've heard it many times before. Just focus on the reverse that Mary talks about in her, uh, in her song. Now things are I'll let you change the turn and touch my hand. The Magnificat, this psalm of poem attributed to Mary, is something we read often, uh, especially at, in Advent around Christmas time, and we've probably read or heard it many times before. And having heard it or read it or seen it, we often fail to realize how radical and revolutionary the song really is when we hear the words of this song or this poem during Advent or the, the words of beautiful, soft, and love. When we hear the words read as part of the Christmas gospel, we are captured by that perfect loveliness, the cadence of the language that's used. We often don't hear what's actually being said. What is Mary actually saying? It's easy to be mesmerized by the music or characterized by the poetry, so we actually miss the, rev the revolutionary nature of this poem, of this song. Now, you use the word revolutionary. Well, almost every commentator who commentates on this passage calls it that word. He uses that word. He's Stanley Jones, famous speech of two generations ago, said that the Magnificat is the most revolutionary document in the world. Goldman, he's a, a Dutch theologian, said the Magnificat announces powerful revolutionary principles. New Testament scholar Murray said, I talked about the revolutionary germ found in the Magnificat. Willie Barkley says that. The Magnificat is a bombshell. Uh, it says it takes the standards of the world and turns them upside down. Uh, Barclay says that in the Magnificat there are 
three revolutions. An economic revolution, a political revolution, and a moral revolution. So another author says that the magnificent comforts the lowly and terrifies the rich. Gilmore says that the magnificent fosters revolutionary in our culture. And this is what I want us to get from this passage today. The revolutionary nature of it. How all these commentators look at this passage and say it is revolution. Don't be mesmerized by the music. Don't be tranquilized by the loveliness of the language or the poetry. Listen to the meaning and allow that revolution to do something in your own life. We are in what they now call the fourth industrial revolution. Maybe you've heard that phrase. Well, if there's a fourth revolution, it must be four. Three that gone before, and they, they are. The first industrial revolution was in 1765. It was when it went to mechanization, powered by steam and water. The second industrial revolution was in about 1870, when we went to mass production through electricity. The third industrial revolution came in the 1960s, with the revolution of telecommunications and computers. Powered by nuclear energy, and the fourth industrial revolution came in the 21st century. It is the, the revolution of wireless and robotic systems, interconnectedness, and time information. Now, I say all of that because in each of those, each of those moments in our history, we took a leap forward. Something changed. A revolution means a total change in the way we do things. So we can talk about before the revolution and after the revolution. In other words, before the first industrial revolution, people lived on farms and they, they, they looked after themselves. After the first industrial revolution, that changed. After the second, it changed. Nothing happens in a revolution that completely changes the way we think of that. The Magnificat is God's revolution. The Magnificat is the charter, the document, the constitution of what God is going to do in Jesus. He's going to turn the world upside down. <coughs> 25 years ago, South Africa, the very political persuasions, all gathered to write the South African Constitution. The Constitution is the basic fundamental document. You can amend it, as we've seen in this uh, last couple of weeks. If you can amend it or not, you can't change the basic Constitution. The Constitution is the fundamental document on which relationships are based in our society now for the last 25 years. The Magnificat is God's charter, it is God's constitution. It lays down the fundamental principles of how we should relate to one another in God's kingdom. And it totally changes the order of things. God takes that which is on the bottom and puts it on the top, and He takes it which is on the top and puts it at the bottom. He turns the world upside down. Before God's revolution, we were impressed with money, power, and status, and education. As somebody said, we were impressed by beauty bucks and brains. But after the revolution, after God's revolution takes, takes hold in us, God turns our value system upside down. The poor are on the top, the rich are at the bottom. It's a revolution, God's revolution. The Magnificat comes of God's love for those who are economically poor. When God's Spirit is inside of us as Christians, we have a renewed compassion and action for the poor. Our hearts are turned upside down. I did a wedding yesterday, last day, so much way. And one of Tony Robinson's couple, he's on one knee, so I think he did a ceremony, and the ceremony had the <coughs> bride and the groom, a uh, lovely Christian couple. And uh, I met the bride's grandfather. And uh, the lovely little lady said this. They used a doctor. And uh, he was standing there for, for, for many years. And he was in private practice. But he, he volunteered in a free clinic for the poor. Why would you do that? Because God's revolution has got into, into your heart, into your soul. 90 years old. He's still working. Listen carefully to the words of the Magnificat. Not the poetry of the words, not the beauty of the words, not the loveliness of the words. Listen to the verbs that are used. In the Magnificat, God tells us that I'm 
to. In the end of it, God tells us that God does some things for the poor. It says God regards or respects the poor. God exalts the poor. God feeds the poor. God helps the poor. God remembers the poor. These, these things are central to God's love for the world. And we see this in Mary herself. That when, that when God chose Mary to be the mother of Jesus, He chose the same girl. He didn't choose the one of this Jerusalem beauty pageant. He chose a 13 year old girl. He didn't choose a mother who had won the lottery or had run a multinational business empire. He didn't choose a bride with a PhD in rocket science. He chose a 13 year old girl from a fourth world country with a dark skin, with dark brown eyes and dark brown hair. To be the mother of Jesus. The Bible calls her a handmaid that actually, actually, not really to the word, do not a servant. She was a servant. God chose a servant girl from a fourth world country to be exalted and lifted up. Mary is the epitome of what she's talking about in the song. The song of Mary is a revolutionary bombshell that turns the values of this world upside down. And Mary herself is a revolutionary. You see, in the magnificent, God changes our values, God changes the way we function. Before the revolution, we were impressed with the rich. After God's revolution, we were impressed with the poor. Before God's revolution, we were impressed with bucks and beauty. After God's revolution, we are impressed with paupers and poor people. The magnificent is revolutionary stuff. It changes the way we see the world. It changes the way we think. It changes the way we think. Now you might think, well, this is just an exception. It's a kind of aberration. But if you read through Luke's Gospel, you'll see this is continually the message that comes to us in Luke's Gospel. Right through Luke's Gospel. The first sermon that Jesus preached in Luke, Luke chapter 4, what does he say? Jesus says, I have, to go, I have come to bring good news to the Pope, release for the prisoners, freedom for those who are in prison. Good news for the poor. And through the whole of his gospel, he wants to emphasize that Jesus is good news for the poor. In, in Luke's account of the Beatitudes, they slightly different to Matthew. The first Beatitude in Matthew says, this is our poor in spirit. In Luke, the Beatitude reads like this, this is our poor. Luke's emphasis is on the poor. This is on the poor because they know they need for God. And this is the truth, isn't it? The richer you are, the less need you have for God in your life. Jesus is saying, let's not put it, let's not leave it for us. In the Magnificat, in Mary's revolutionary song, she says that God respects the poor, God exalts the poor, God cares for the poor, God feeds the poor, God remembers the poor, God helps those who are poor. That's the rhythm of this song, and that's the rhythm of the kingdom of God. And that's the rhythm that God wants us to get into, especially in this Christmas season. You see, before the revolution, before God's revolution in my life, I regarded myself. Before God's revolution in me, I exalted my ego. Before God's revolution in my values, I only looked out for myself and those who are close to me. Before God's revolution, I only helped those who could help me back. Before God's revolution, I only remembered my relatives and those who I kept for my small circle. But after the revolution comes into my life, that whole that thing expands exponentially. You regard the poor and the needs. After God's revolution, you exalt the energy of the poor. After God's revolution, you feed the hungry and the starving. After God's revolution, you help the disabled and the marginalized. After God's revolution in your heart, you, you become aware of the real needs of people. 
Life can be similar to what life was like before or after the revolution. Now we live in a country where we have a wonderful constitution. Well, we have a constitution, some people think it's wonderful, some people think it's not. We can. It's possible to be a citizen of a country and not be part of the revolution. It's been a way part of South Africa since our transition. It's possible to go to the festivities of the revolution and not be part of it. Part of it. And you also may be part of the church, but not part of God's revolution in spite of it. You might celebrate the festivals, Advent, Christmas, Lent, and Easter, and Pentecost, and so on, but not be changed by it. Because when God gets inside you, God changes everything. So, my prayer for you today is that God will do a revolution inside your heart. That God will change your values. If it hasn't happened already. And if it has had to read, then it will go even deeper. The question I want to leave with you this morning is this. Simply this. Has God's revolution occurred in the law? Have things been turned upside down? <clears throat> but what is important to you is not you and the people that are in your immediate circle. But where you are Dedicated to exalting the poor, regarding the poor, feeding the poor, helping the poor, remembering the poor. Those who have in you. And if that has happened, what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with that in this Christmas season? What does that mean for you in this Christmas season? Let's pray. Father, it's easy to talk about these things, but it's hard to do them. Because we don't live in a world that functions this way. We don't live in a world that sees life through these lenses. And we live in such a world. We live in a world where it's all about what we can get and how we can advance ourselves. We fail to notice those around us who have real. So, what I pray is that you would revolutionize. Our way of seeing and thinking and acting in this Christmas season, particularly. That we'll be very conscious of those around us for whom Christmas is not necessarily good news because of economic issues. Many have lost work, especially in this COVID time. Many of them have Many have lost loved ones. Struggling with grief. Help us all. It's not to become so wrapped up in our own celebration that we are unaware of others who are struggling. And another revolution is to take, take our hearts and our minds and our lives and turn them upside down. We've got to do one of